Hi, everybody. Dr. Jenkins here. So I would like to give my uh, lecture on the sophists um, this way through uh, video. And so that we can uh, have that done and not have to take another class period for that. So uh, I'm going to share the screen with you here. Let's see, share screen. There we go. Okay. Let's see. There we go. <clears throat> okay. So around 500 BCE, there was nothing like a unified Greek state. We're looking at a uh, picture of Athens there. People lived in or owed allegiance to a large number of city-states. Now, a city-state was an area where one city was dominant. So it was kind of like, there were kind of like little countries, although organized around individual cities. So um, two things happened around the beginning of the fifth century BCE to contribute to the prominence of Athens. So one was democracy. So for a century, the common people had some voice in the government of Athens. So this is Solon, S-O-L-O-N, the constitution of Solon, he was a leader in Athens at one point, uh, divided the uh, power among several bodies. So rather than just the aristocrats being in charge of everything, the power was distributed. So the people who didn't have as much property or you know the poor or whatever they had a say for a period of time this is really rare in history so the council that was the organization of the city state the governance was composed of two two uh two um areas two groups of folks one was the council it was okay. So the council was one and the assembly was the other. The whole thing, I started to call the whole thing the council. The council was the aristocrats, the so called best men, and they were the richer folks. And then the assembly were all free men, regardless of whether they had property or anything. Of course, disenfranchised was women and uh, slaves, not considered full citizens. So important decisions were made by the council, that's the, uh, the aristocratic um, group, but the assembly, which was the, all the free men, uh, could veto. So someone could veto something in the assembly, and that's a lot of power. In 508 BCE, a quarrel arose concerning citizenship for a large influx of immigrants. So a bunch of immigrants, they wanted to have come in. The aristocrats were fearful for their power. So they tried to purge the citizenship roles. But the assembly passed a proposal to extend citizenship to many of the new residents, many of these immigrants. So this resulted in actually a three-day siege of the Acropolis, uh, Acropolis by the people. Uh, and finally, the people won, and the aristocrats capitulated. For about 100 years after that, the citizens had control of major decisions. So this was a, sort of a golden age here for uh, freedom and having a say in government. So now that was one thing that happened that made... Um, Athens preeminent uh, at the time, um, a powerful and very influential city-state. The other thing was the Persian War. So the Greek colonies, let's see something. The Greek colonies rebelled in 499 BCE against Persia for taxing them. So all the, those areas that Thales and Anaximander and other, uh, many of the pre-Socratics were from and where they lived were in the Greek colonies across the sea from where Greece, uh, the, the Grecian states were. 
So the colonies across the sea, still part of Greece, still consider themselves Greek. A lot of the citizens, a lot of people from Greece would, would colonize that area, but it was controlled more or less by Persia. And for a long time, Persia didn't, uh, didn't worry a lot about taxation and stuff, but then they did, and they started to sort of get heavy handed with it. And the Greek colonists, they rebelled at that and they fought back. This led to in 490, you know, remember when we're moving forward in time, when we're talking about BC or BCE, a year passing will be from um, 499 to 498. Right, that's a year. A year past that, a year in the future, the past of 499 would be 500. <laughs> okay, uh, and they most certainly use different numbers at that time. So this is this is out of convenience for us to be able to um, to be able to locate in history with a certain kind of fairly reliable timeline what happened. So in 490, or about 10 years after the colonies rebelled against Persia. Uh, in 490, the Greeks defeat Persia at the Battle of Marathon. It's a very big deal, very big battle. Um, in 480, Xerxes, the Persian king, advanced towards Athens. Now, this was after Marathon, so the Persians kept coming on. And the Persians, well, actually, they left and they came back. The Persians conquered the city, but Athens had built up its navy. Uh, so the Navy battle took place, this isn't the Navy battle, but this is another painting of the battle, uh, Marathon actually, but um, at Salamis, the uh, Athenians defeated the Persians uh, with their Navy. Athens became a preeminent uh, city-state after that because they bore the brunt of the fighting. They really sort of, uh, they distinguished themselves in battle. So everyone who was fighting uh, in this sort of league of nations that came together to fight the Persians, they all saw the Athens, uh, the Athenians were very uh, brave and fought diligently. And uh, so after that, a defense league was formed uh, after the defeat of the Persians, uh, Athens became sort of the administrator of this league, sort of for mutual protection, a little bit like NATO is now. Uh, if you know anything about NATO in uh, Europe, as far as being a kind of many states coming together for mutual protection, a little bit like this, the Delian, the Delian or Delian League was uh, headed by Athens, but actually what it became was Athens kind of took over the whole thing and it became a kind of Athenian empire. So other states would pay tribute to Athens. Athens became very wealthy, engaged in trading far and wide across the globe. Um, and Athens became a center of Greek life and much of life, uh, much of uh, other life too. Other people would come there. So the social situation in fifth century Athens called for innovation and education. Things were changing. People were now uh, especially going to need to know how to talk uh, in presentation. For instance, in the court, if somebody brings a suit against you, you, you have to go to the council and you have to make your case. There are no like lawyers for hire or anything like that. Or if you sued somebody else or whatever, if you had charges brought against you, you had to, to make your case yourself. <clears throat> um, so, Actual ability over, say, aristocratic origin became more and more value. So a class of teachers arose offering higher education, and many were itinerant or people who moved around, professors who charged money. Now, they claimed to teach things that foster both personal and political success, <clears throat> these sophists. But, and among other subjects, they taught astronomy, geometry, arithmetic, and music. But what really sold what they were teaching was the teaching of rhetoric. These are just uh, pictures of sophists here. Um, of course, all done later. There, there are no, uh, no extant, still existing uh, pictures of these people. These are all like 
somewhat fanciful or imaginative uh, renderings of what the people might have looked like, perhaps from stories, perhaps out of people's own imagination. So all the sophists taught rhetoric. Now, rhetoric is the principle and practice of persuasive speaking. It's all about persuasion. This art's very valuable in democratic Athens where persuasively making your case in court was important. Very important to be able to make your case in court, but only the richest uh, people could afford to have their children uh, be um, schooled by these sophists. So by using rhetoric, one can make a case for any position at all. Now, this is sort of the, the philosophical implications. The social implications of the sophists were that they created a situation where, where education was expensive and uh, which might be, which might uh, ring a bell for today. Uh, but uh, the richest people, again, uh, could have their children perhaps uh, take uh, lessons from the sophists and learn rhetoric or how to sometimes it's called make the weaker argument the stronger. So uh, they would they would argue that they could make a convincing case on either of two sides in anything. And from this kind of idea, this sort of selling or marketing point that they could argue a case on either side, uh, which, by the way, the purpose of that was to sell their wares because you may not know what you're going to need to argue for or against at some future time in the in the assembly, in the in front of the council. So you would um, you wouldn't know what position to take. So it would make sense if someone wants you to pay them to teach you how to do this, that they would teach you how to take any side on any argument because you don't know in advance what side you're going to need to take. So these sophists, many of them claim they could teach others how to make the weaker argument the stronger. So like some weak argument, they could teach you how to build it up so that even though you had a really a lousy argument for something, you could make it sound like it was better. This is going to recur again later on we're going to hear about this in the Apology, the defense of Socrates, uh, which was uh, an important writing of Plato's we're going to read. So, but this technique of making the weaker argument the stronger, of being able to teach either side of an argument, has some profoundly skeptical consequences. Uh, the practice of rhetoric then raises doubts about our ability to discern reality. Um, and many sophists went there. They would argue that uh, uh, human beings are confined to appearances. Truth is beyond us. If things are as they seem to be, that has to be the truth. So skepticism, sort of extreme skepticism. And this is not, this isn't skepticism, like healthy skepticism. But this is extreme skepticism, and it's the view that for every claim to know, reason can be given to doubt it. You can always doubt any kind of claim. Now, healthy skepticism is doubting something until you have a good reason. If you have a good reason for something, then you can't really doubt it without being ridiculous. It's, there's a certain kind of reasonable skepticism that just is to protect us from making mistakes of biases or just logical mistakes that we want to we be skeptical. So that's kind of two different two different uses. So just kind of be aware that sometimes it's used in the sense of extreme uh, doubt, no matter what the claim is, and other times it is uh, it is merely to not trust out of hand one's own views or or anybody's views to dig a little deeper and to be a little skeptical until one finds a good reason for a view. So relativism is the position as articulated by Protagoras. And according to Sextus Empiricus, Protagoras said that man is the measure of all things, of things that are, that they are, of things that are not, that they are not. So a measure is a standard or criterion 
right? So a criterion is like a, like a mark or a measure of something. Now, many criterions are a criteria. So a criteria is the plural. So a measure is a standard or criterion to appeal to when deciding what to believe. Protagoras statement means that there is no criterion, standard or mark by which to judge except ourselves. Now, this is called, uh, I'm not requiring that you know this, but just to, to let you know the distinction, this is cognitive relativism as opposed to moral or cultural relativism. They're all similar in that there's, uh, there's no like absolute truth or objective truth about uh, for, a, for there to be a standard on any of those things. But the standard that we can't have uh, in cognitive relativism says that we can't know the truth. We can't know knowledge. We can have no objective knowledge, no pathway to objective knowledge. Simply, there is no truth independent of what seems to be true. So the sophists developed the notion that custom was the king of all in relation to distinction between physis and nomos. nomos. Physis, physis and nomos. So physis, P-H-Y-S-I-S, -S, is our kind of the root word for our term physics. So it means something like nature uh, versus nomos, N-O-M-O-S, nomos, which is our root for words like normal or normative uh, or normalization. It refers to a standard of some sort. So what we have here though is physis, is nature independent of what human beings impose on it. So think of a law of nature, for instance, uh, gravity, we call it gravity. Now, a law of nature is not like human laws. There's not like if you manage to somehow jump up in the air uh, in an otherwise uh, gravity filled situation and we're able to suspend right there, nobody would give you a ticket or anything. You wouldn't be put in jail for breaking the laws of nature. Um, although it's questionable whether you could actually do that, uh, highly questionable, but, um, but laws of nature are called laws, I'm not really sure, they're just, they're, they're really uh, intact theories, like theories that have so much going for them, they're just, they just seem to be totally true all the time. So, uh, Physis is nature, like physical or physics. So nomos, on the other hand, and what I'm giving you these pictures for is to kind of like get in your mind, physis has to do with nature. So you see this sort of Athens uh, scene with all the trees, and just this natural sort of look, although there's a lot of building and structure there too, a lot of human design in this picture. But then nomos, to illustrate nomos, I'm just giving you uh, you know, people talking and this sort of, uh, this, this soldier or this leader talking to people, maybe about the law, maybe telling them some new law. So nomos is custom or convention. So uh, custom, we know what that means. We do things by custom. Uh, we have a custom of say, um, of say there's a custom in uh, the West that is like America and Europe and places like that to read from left to right, that's our custom, but there's no natural law that says we have to read that way. And some societies read from right to left. Similarly, cars in England drive on the left side of the road. There's no natural law that says it has to be that way. Neither driving on the left side of the road or right is natural. We simply agreed to it. And that's all that is called for, for custom or convention. So something is conventional if it's sort of agreed upon by people and it's done for that reason. So if things are the way they are, now, now here's the question. What does this say about some of our questions? Uh, if things are the way they are because uh, due to physis, then we can't go against them. You know, we can't jump up and suspend ourselves in air. It's a, a law of nature just means that it's something that's true across the board of everybody. So for instance, if, uh, 
if you give John an ounce of strychnine, this will cause John to die uh, if there are no remedies taken or anything. This is just nature. This is just what naturally happens when those compounds, they uh, get into, uh, you know, they meet the system. They meet the human system. That's the way that works. You know, combustion, uh, you put certain th chemicals together, they explode, certain things can kill us. Um, you, know, you hit yourself in the head hard enough, you're going to cause it to bleed or damage. These are natural things. It's not based on agreement. It's also part of the way things are that poisoning another human being is punished, but the punishment is something that it's by convention, by custom. It's logically possible. It's, it's naturally possible, meaning it's, it, it would be consistent with nature, or at least it wouldn't be inconsistent with nature to uh, not punish somebody for poisoning someone else. The sophist brought out this distinction clearly and le led to questions that will be important to the later tradition. For, ex ex uh, for instance, do the gods exist by physis or nomos, do the gods exist? And here's here's a nice little uh, sculpture of the Greek gods. So do the gods exist from nature, like they really do exist in nature, or is it human construction building these stories? Now, either way, there could be a super powerful influence on human beings to have gods like the Greek pantheon. But the question for philosophers is, do they really exist in nature or do they exist by nomos, just by convention? Similarly, uh, this comes up very uh, significantly for Plato, is uh, justice good by nature? Is morality good by nature? Or is it entirely nomos? Is it entirely law? Uh, I mean, natural law. Does it come from the natural, do, do humans make up what justice is, what fairness is, and what should be done there? Or does that come somehow from nature? Does nature dictate what justice is? So these are explorations that we're going to be uh, embarking on with, uh, with uh, our next uh, foray into Socrates. So um, that's all I have for you now. And uh, I hope this, uh, this video helps your understanding of the sophist. And any questions, please do let me know. And I'll see you all very soon. Bye-bye.